Hi, everybody, and welcome to the May 13th, 2016 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's get a quick take on the allegations from 7 News political reporter Marshall Zellinger that 10 signatures on John Kaiser's petitions are fabricated. Let's see what happens when he, asked, when he was asked about it. Good so time. back to the voters who told me yeah. their signatures were forged. Yeah. I've counted 10 so far. If there's more, it's possible you didn't collect enough to really make the ballot. No, it's what is your response to that? I'm on the ballot. I'm on the ballot, and there are people like you that have done the Democrats' work that have spent hundreds of hours on this. Uh, it's not going to take away from the fact that I'm on the ballot and that I'm going to beat Michael Bennett. If you haven't seen the video, it just gets more entertaining from there. Patty Calhoun from Westward, this seems like a lesson of how to make a small problem much, much worse. What did you think? I'm on the show and I don't have to say anything else. Now, <laughs> he, had, he had time to come up with an answer. That's what's so bad about this because after the story broke, Progress Now broke it with just one. And then Marshall Zellinger from Channel 7 did a great job, went out and did pounded the pavement the way reporters are supposed to, knocked on doors, came up with 10 more very solid examples. But Kaiser had several days in which he could prepare a response that made some sense beyond, I'm on the ballot. Yeah, he's on the ballot, but he might be getting a little asterisk next to his name soon, just like Ryan Frazier, because it does look like whoever was out there with these petitions did a really bad job and maybe an intentionally bad job. That doesn't mean that Kaiser signed up everyone's name, so he should be able to come up with a fairly logical pass the buck explanation, but instead the stonewalling looks really bad. The stonewalling became the story instead of uh, the, which got even worse. David Copel from the Independence Institute and DU Law School, uh, even though we're a month out from the official, I guess we have to use quotation marks at this point, official ballots going out, uh, will this issue continue to dog Kaiser? Depends on whether more forged signatures are, are found. Um, prudent candidates probably shouldn't hire uh, the firm that hired these petition gatherers in, in the future. And one of the purposes, a good purpose, of the petition requirement for the 1500 signatures in each of the seven congressional districts is you have to have a good organization that can do things like that and if you don't then you're just uh, reliant on paid gatherers who can be of uh, varying quality and he only barely got on with the paid gatherers and that that's a sign of organizational weakness and potential weakness uh, for a November campaign against a candidate who will be very formidable and well funded. Eric Sonneman, political analyst. Uh, what astonished me was after this interview with 7 News, uh, Kaiser doubled down the same uh, answer when he talked to a reporter from 9 News. So it wasn't as if this was just the immediate you gotcha moment. It, it was certainly, at the very least, seemed like strategy. Uh, if, if you're called in for political advice at this point, what do you offer? Um, I pass on that. <laughs> I, I pass on the request. <laughs> Thank you very much. But. Uh, it has been a wild week, uh, a, a very good week for Marshall Zellinger at Channel 7. I mean, that's what old shoe reporting is, just as Patty pointed out before we tape, knock on doors and, and, and break his story. A not so good week for John Kaiser, a very bad week for the consultants who handled this petition drive, a very bad week for the somebody named Marine, who was apparently the circulator who forged uh, these signatures and she has some kind of telltale loop in her the way in, in her handwriting and all these signatures had a similar telltale uh, telltale loop it's become a national story it's not just a local story the Washington Post in their what's it called the fix I believe their political blog had a story this morning just taking Kaiser apart Senate races have become nationalized now you need to raise money if you're a formidable candidate on a national level guy has somewhat become a laughing stock. It reminds me of the Marco Rubio moment in that New Hampshire debate when he just, he had one talking point and one talking point only and he kept going back to it in, in a painful way. Remember Al Gore back during the Clinton years when he had some fundraising scandal? He kept going back to this notion of no controlling legal authority and he much, must have mentioned that phrase a dozen times. It was painful to watch. Ramsey Scott joins us from the Colorado Statesman. Thank you very much for uh, being here. What's the reaction you're hearing about this? Uh, 
real, and not, I don't want to say political disaster, but the very least very interesting thing to talk about on a Friday. Well, a, a lot of reporters, when, well, first off, it, it made the rounds in the press corps, uh, and there were some laughs, to say the least, on this. It, this is the perfect example of not doing the right thing when you have a mistake. Instead of coming out and saying, yeah, I'm upset about this, too. I'm concerned about this, too. I'm going to get to the bottom of it. These 10 votes, I mean, the voters aren't going to be the difference, though, for me making the ballot. You know, you can turn into an issue on voter ID, anything like that. Instead, just a stonewall. It's, I think it's the perfect example of a, a candidate who has a really good resume on paper. But if they don't have that experience answering those questions, it's pretty obvious in an instance like this. So. Um, it'll be interesting to see what sort of happens. I think the reaction there from reporters is that uh, this issue is not going to be going away. And I mean, within 15 minutes of this video being released, several Twitter um, profiles were up just making fun of him on this. So I think this is going to be an issue that dogs him until the primary. Yeah, the dog one, the pun definitely <laughs> intended, absolutely. Great Danes everywhere yeah. are, are happy about that one. The 2016 legislative session came to a fast and furious end this week as lawmakers tried to take action on several issues before the deadline approached on Wednesday. Among the issues passed included a bill that would allow for sale of full strength beer, wine and liquor in grocery stores over the next several years with various stipulations. However, Governor Hickenlooper's support of the bill is not guaranteed. Uh, Patty, even though we've seen uh, the bill pass and it, 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 there was uh, uh, a lot of celebration, at least at the Capitol when it passed, between the confusion over it and the tepid response from the governor's office, it's still not a done deal. What do you, what do you, how do you react to the bill? I'm guessing this bill will not be signed, and partly it's because the governor doesn't understand it. He's not the, he said that um, in his briefing after the legislative session. He's not the only one who doesn't understand it. Dickie Lee, Lee Hollinghurst was saying the lobbyists were the ones who pushed it through. I talked to a lobbyist who doesn't understand it. No one understands it. And Lord knows I've paid attention to liquor and beer over the years, and I don't understand it. I know that... Um, it is way, way too complicated for what should be a fairly simple decision. Do Coloradans want full strength beer in, in convenience stores or grocery stores? There are different variations on that. Do they want to have spirits there? Do they want to have wine there? And will it affect the craft beer industry? There are a lot of questions and it, this just muddies the water more. Remember, we also have a petition drive that looks like it will get on the ballot in November if they want it to be on the ballot in November. So we've got to see if they want to go forward with their proposal. David, just like Patty talked about, there's a potential ballot proposal, and that seemed to be the impetus behind this effort in trying to stem that so that that wouldn't make the ballot. Uh, did this help that cause? Did it hurt that cause? Is the ballot the right way to go? Well, the ballot at least is a better way to go than this process. My, everything you need to know about the Colorado legislature is in my dad's book, Rules for State Legislators. And in one section, he explains that the, the last five days of the session are the most dangerous because that's when the rules are, the normal rules are suspended. And so we see this year, as in previous years, lots of last minute attempts to put very complicated, push through very complicated things in the last few days to avoid public scrutiny and avoid the debate. If this had been a bill that was properly introduced in January, then you would have had lots of time for committee hearings and problems with the language could have been fixed if there's contradictions or, you know, if even the, the liquor lobbyists can't understand what's in the bill, maybe it's actually incomprehensible and going through the, the proper process would have perhaps uh, produced a comprehensible bill which you could be for or against on the merits rather than not even understanding what's in it. Eric, do you think the governor waits uh, on further progress on the ballot issue to decide the veto or does he simply go with uh, what his instincts are on this particular bill regardless of the ballot issue? Well, I think he waits a while. He has 30 days. The clock started when that bill hit his desk a day or two ago, so he has a while. I assume he'll do some outreach. He'll meet with interested parties. Um, he'll do his due diligence. I'm going to take a little exception, Dominic, to the way you framed the question. In the first place, you used words like the fast and furious end of this legislative session. Maybe it was fast and furious in sort of a careless sense, <laughs> but I would describe it as more slow and tedious uh, in terms of the overall uh, legislative session. In terms of this particular issue, the only reason it was considered in that final week, in my mind, is because of the looming threat of the ballot measure. If that ballot measure 
out there getting signatures as we speak was not there, I don't think this issue would have ever arisen in those closing days or closing hours. So the threat of a ballot measure had a major impact in just getting the legislature to deal with it. I have to surmise that there is polling out there that shows it might have a chance or maybe more than a chance or the opponents of the ballot measure wouldn't have been in incentivized to come to the table and compromise. The whole thing does strike me as weird. I, as, you, as, as somebody postulated, I guess, Patty, you know, either you're in favor of this, as 90% of the other states do it, where you can walk into a liquor store and buy a bottle of wine with your steak grocery or store. your salmon, excuse me, a grocery store with your steak or your salmon or whatever you're having for dinner, or you're opposed to it. And I, the notion of a 20-year phase-in, which is what this is, strikes me as a, a very awkward way to, to split, the, split the baby. Ramsey, you were there as it, as it was all going down, whether it was fast and furious, slow and tedious, a <laughs> little bit of both. Uh, what was your take? Um, this was definitely something where, I mean, every single legislator that came up to speak about this said the same thing. I hate this bill, but I will sign this bill. Um, they were basically, this is sort of a last ditch effort to sort of keep what the system is right now and slowly phase it in and giving those liquor store owners, those small mom and pop stores, as Governor Hickenlooper likes to sort of talk about when he's talking about this bill, um, gives them a chance to either adjust to the new um, landscape of uh, liquor sales in Colorado or to get out of the game completely. But I, I really feel the only reason this made it through, besides from that pressure of this ballot initiative looming out there, is that Pat Stedman, um, senator from Denver, just last just termed out now, was the one who took into this uh, to charge of this issue. Even though, as he said on the floor, I did not want this issue. This issue came to me. Um, he is well liked on both sides of the aisle. He is the big negotiator when it comes to a lot of different issues, whether it be the budget or any other number of things. So I feel that he was able to bring um, that. Good goodwill that he has to bear on this bill, but no one liked it. It was more of a, it's either this or we take our chances of balloting initiative. I don't think too many people wanted that in, the, in the, either the House or the Senate. Many of the major initiatives that made headlines uh, that made headlines throughout the session ended up failing to make the governor's desk. Among the highest profile issues that failed were the proposals to bring back a presidential primary system to Colorado, a construction defects bill, and a hospital provider fee program. David, in a split legislature that we have, um, it's not surprising to see to not see a lot of bills make the governor's desk. But were you surprised to see so little action on these major headline issues? It wasn't lack of action. It was a decision that these are bad proposals. And the people of Colorado, since 1975, have overwhelmingly chosen to have divided government, either between the governor, the House, and the Senate, that you have some diversity in party control. And that has worked well for Colorado in general. And, and when we've abandoned it, it sometimes led to extreme results as in the, the wild rumpus of the, the 2013 legislative session. So I think the legislature did the right thing and, and was cautious and prudent net. Uh, and and that that's, works well in Colorado. Uh, Herr Drumpf's attack on of lies on the Colorado caucus system, the, the you know as as he's well aware, if you tell a big lie, m most people tell little lies routinely in their lives, but they're not audacious enough to tell flat out immense huge lies, and so they think if you say something that's really extreme, they think oh maybe that's true, and of course that's what he did about the Colorado caucuses, saying that nobody voted when in fact six sixty five thousand. Republicans voted in the caucus, which led to him being completely shut out by the wise voters of Colorado. So it would be absolutely sending the wrong signal in Colorado and nationally to change our primary system uh, or caucus system or whatever our presidential system could be at the end of this legislative session in a rushed way. We've got four years to do it and can do it under with proper debate and not under the shadow of his, his big lie about Colorado. And on the hospital tax, uh, I think the legislature did the right thing as well. One of the ways that the big government in Colorado has evaded the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is accounting tricks so that now 60 percent of the state budget is outside of the, cons the constraints of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, and this would have aggravated the problem further. All they had to do if they want to spend more money is just go to the voters and ask. 
And of course, the reason they didn't want to do that and they wanted to use accounting tricks instead is because, as Governor Hickenlooper accurately said earlier this year, uh, this huge, massive spending increase would be soundly rejected by the voters. Eric, this felt to me that there. this is a setup for a lot of great, juicy ballot issue battles uh, this November. Do you think we'll see uh, many come from this or maybe just a, a smattering? Well, I think there's going to be such a glut of ballot issues. I wrote a column in the Post on this a few weeks ago. We've had a few years where there haven't been that many ballot issues this year, and I don't know how much of it really owes to the legislature and their inaction. But uh, we're going to see, I mean, whether the liquor issue is on there or not, you have single-payer health care, uh, you have various fracking measures, you have Tabor reform through the Better Colorado effort, you have constitutional reform of how measures get on the ballot, you have a presidential primary and the whole issue of unaffiliated, you probably have a right to die issue, you might have a cigarette tax, I could go on and on. It is going to be an overwhelming uh, ballot this fall and that is not all good. As to the legislative session quickly. A year ago we passed a measure that was one of the hallmarks of the last legislative session and the title of it was pay for success and it was about social impact bonds. Let's hope the legislature's own pay is not geared to success because there was not a lot of success coming out of this session. There kept being the notion throughout the session that there was a deal to be made and that what the Democrats and Governor Hickenlooper wanted, which was largely around the hospital provider fee and the classification of those funds, and what the Republicans wanted, whether it was around roads or whether uh, road funding or whether it was about equal funding for charter schools, which is a hard one to argue against, that maybe there was a deal to be made. At the 11th hour or the midnight hour, there was just no deal. There was no goodwill. It was a combination of the divided legislature and the election year, and that just shut everything down. Ramsey, was any of this surprising to you, your Capitol reporter colleagues, as you saw everything go down? Not particularly. We, uh, I was making the joke that if you had a bill and you were, uh, you held a press conference for it, it was going to fail this year. Um, all those big issues, whether it be the hospital provider fee or trans bonds, when that eventually popped up, there just wasn't enough um, wiggle room. We, we I mean, there were, and the funny thing is, is that there kept being optimism, like, oh, we're still having talks, and there were talks. There were talks going on basically all hours of the day leading up into those final days of the session. But, you know, not only a divided government, but, you know, on the wrap-ups yesterday when um, leaders of the House and the Senate um, and the minority parties as well all had their press conferences, they all said the same thing. Well, this will get solved in November when we win. Um, and that basically seems to be their strategy that we've tried. Um, Republicans in the Senate, you know, when they talked about the trans bond, they was like, listen, we've, we, we adjusted this, we, we did the best that we could, and construction defects as well. We did this, we tried to appease, and we couldn't. I feel that uh, construction defects might be the best chance to have um, action next year um, in the legislative session. A lot of Republicans seem to think that the Speaker of the House, Dekeley Hollinghorst, She's just so opposed to any sort of um, fix on that that there might be a chance with new leadership. But it really is just a lot of finger pointing and saying, well, this will help our party in the fall. Patty, uh, not a whole lot of surprises, but do you think this sets us up for a fun November? Oh, a very fun November in so many ways. I went and it's too late for citizens to petition, put petitions on the ballot. Those, those had to be settled by April, and, but they now have to go out and get signatures. They have until August for those. There's only one on the ballot so far, which is uh, Colorado Cares mm -hmm. Amendment uh, 69. So the primary one I see will be a really interesting discussion because that they were working on that before Donald Trump accused Colorado of rigging things, before the, the Republican convention down in Colorado Springs in, in April. These guys have been working on this for a while. People haven't liked the caucus system for a while. And the primary proposal is pretty interesting. It would let unaffiliated people vote, sign up to vote in different uh, parties for that primary, presidential primary. And I think people want to do that, especially after this presidential campaign, where people want to have more of a say in what kind of candidates we're going to come up with, because it's going to be hard to decide in November. Security is at issue this week in the civil trial involving families of the victims of Aurora Theater of the, of the Aurora Movie Theater shooting and Cinemark, the company that owns the theater. The lawsuit claims that theater workers failed to properly secure the building and could have ultimately prevented the shootings. Kevin Taylor, attorney for the Cinemark Theaters, claims that the theater could not have foreseen the attack. 
Eric, what did you think of uh, what do you think of the civil lawsuit now against the theaters? I think as little as you can imagine about the civil lawsuit, our hearts continue to go out to these families and the grief that will be part of their life forever. But uh, this lawsuit strikes me as uh, as symptomatic of a country that is overly involved in litigation, overly litigious. Uh, there's a great book 20 years ago, The Death of Common Sense, about how we, uh, informative for me, about how as a society we have turned so many issues over to trial lawyers and the reign of trial lawyers. Um, how did, how could any theater company, there was not a specific threat. No one called up and said or sent a note and made a threat against this theater. How could this have been reasonably foreseen? And I think that's the ultimate issue before the judge and the jury. I would hope the judge might make a summary judgment and just ditch this thing for lack of merit. But um, this is a search for a deep pocket, is a search for whenever something bad happens, somebody has to pay. And let's go find a deep pocket who can pay. But if this suit and other suits like it are successful, think of what life becomes like, just routine life, where not only is it TSA when you, have to get on, when you want to get on an airplane, but it's that same kind of procedure when you want to go to a shopping mall, go see a movie, go check out a book at the library, whatever it is. That's the road we're heading down if this kind of lunacy really takes a foothold. Ramsey, do you think uh, other theaters are looking at this case, even if it fails, as a, uh, uh, looking at a reason to adjust their policies? I think not just theaters, but I mean, like you said, I mean, it's it's restaurants, it's malls. If you have this sort of liability aspect, um, and you know, reading through what's been going on in the trial, you know, saying, well, you should have had more security guards. You knew it was going to be a big. Thing. It's that sort of, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I feel that I don't know whether or not people will start to change their um, policies because whether you put a security guard doing with a metal detector at the front of every movie theater, I just don't know if that would happen. But there could be a lot of ramifications from this depending on how it goes, even if it fails, because there will be a lot of companies who are just terrified of what a lawsuit like this might, um, might do to them. Patty, do you think most Coloradans look at this particular scenario and blame this on lack security at a movie theater or just the acts of a madman? I don't think they're blaming the movie theater. And we even before the lawsuit was filed, we saw public places and movie theaters around the state and around the country think about what they wanted to do. You know, some banned, some made it very clear guns weren't allowed, but everyone has looked at what they can do. But would it have made a difference if they even had a metal detector? The guy came in the side door. So maybe they could have had better security, but I think everyone really knows now that you just might not be safe anywhere, and that's really what the world is like now. It was interesting that there was a Homeland Security memo that wasn't allowed in that said um, that theaters might be targets of terrorists, but it wasn't allowed in because this wasn't an act of a terrorist, according to the judge. Then, in that, someone wrote a column that was great comparing this to the math professor who was who was um, suspected of being a terrorist because he was writing math equations on an airplane. David, you're our attorney at the table. I'll hand it to you. Well, it, it'll ultimately be decided by the Colorado Supreme Court if there's a verdict, a jury verdict for the for the plaintiffs. And under traditional tort laws, part of the things you look at is the cost of various security measures versus their potential benefits. And it's possible the Colorado Supreme Court might come up with a mixed decision. For example, why not have alarms when the emergency door is open? That's how the, the criminal came in. That might, might be a low cost thing. On the other hand, you have to have security guards at, at every theater. And this would also be really at every other public place as well. The court might say no on that. Ultimately, it's a, a decision that, that's better made by legislators. It's up, but it's also true that when, while public places like theaters or restaurants or whatever, don't have an obligation affirmatively to protect you, they also have an obligation not to affirmatively create conditions of danger. And Cinemark did that with its no licensed guns policy where they disabled people who had carry permits from being able to protect themselves and others. Well, it is time for a favorite part of the show, Disgrace of the Week. And if you'd like to share your Disgrace of the Week or say something nice on air, tweet us or post us to our Facebook page. But as always, Patty, start us off. 
Well, I rode the first A-Line train that, that first Saturday out to DIA, and when I was returning, they said it was already delayed at 7 a.m. because someone had driven across the tracks. And you're like, oh, how, what a stupid one-time thing. Well, it turns out now, RTD knew that the 10 crossings, the crossing bars don't work. They've got real glitches. CU should take some of its $5 million it paid for the A-Line and have its engineers figure out what is going on at those crossings. David. Trump's continuing lies in, about his, in defense of his refusal to release his tax returns. There's something big in there. At the very least, he's not nearly as rich and successful as he claims to be. The delegates to the Republican National Convention deserve to see them as they would for any other presidential candidate before they vote, and the American people deserve to see them as well. Eric. Those of us on the, quote, reform side of the education policy divide, I think it's obligatory on us to hold our own to account when there's overreach. And in that vein, the two school board members down in Douglas County, Megan, Megan Silverthorne and Judith Reynolds, an unannounced visit to a high school to pull, a, I believe she's 16 years old, 16, 17 year old girl out of class, intimidate her, and that's the only word that I think you can appropriately use for about 90 minutes to call off some planned protest. It was completely over the top. Anytime there's that interaction between school board members and an individual student, something is wrong, and these people, uh, calmer heads need to pre prevail. They overreached. Ramsey. You know, I'm going to say the legislative session, how it ended. Um, you know, I, one of the senior reporters down there said, I've been here for a long time. This isn't the least do-nothing uh, legislative session, but it's up there in the top ranks. There was a lot of opportunity for bipartisanship to actually take place. But I, I, where that broke down, that was in those backroom meetings, but somewhere it broke down, and a lot of work that could have gotten done and could have been met in the middle just didn't happen. We need to say something nice very quickly. Patty. New Lieutenant Governor um, Donna Lynn, and we will hope she will continue Joe Garcia's footsteps doing things as the Lieutenant Governor. David. The Brazilian Senate for moving forward on the impeachment of their crooked lion president, Dilma Rousseff, uh, that sets a good example for us to follow in a few years. <laughs> <laughs> Same place as Patty, our new Lieutenant Governor Donna Lynn, with an asterisk that it shows you can have a not a background in politics, a background in business, and still be substantive and responsible, unlike somebody else who seems to be in the news a lot <laughs> these days. Ramsey. I really hate to be an echo chamber, but I'm going to say Donna Lynn as well. I had a chance to sit in all of her confirmation hearings, and she, I believe she's going to do a very good job for this state, not only um, carrying on Joe Garcia's legacy, but really, I think, helping bipartisanship kind of uh, make its way maybe back into the legislature. <laughs> that would be something. That's all the time we have tonight. Thanks for tuning in. For everyone here at Channel 12, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thanks for watching. Good night.